dwellers in the valley. They were an ancient biblical nation living near the land of Cana. But they dwell in a desert place. That's where they come from. And they dwell in the valley. Anything that comes from a desert environment is barren, is dry, and is unfruitful. Watch this. The minute an Amalekite spirit begins to attack you, they're going to look for those people that are going through a valley experience. We have all gone through that. We have all gone through our valleys. God did not ever say that he's going to, he's going to, we are not going to go through valley experiences. But they are seeking out those people that comes down in the valley. Valley in scripture speaks about sin and wickedness. Hold on. Mountains is mentioned over 500 times in scripture, but valley is mentioned some 28 times or something around there. But scripturally, valley speaks about sin, it speaks about wickedness, it's cinemas to depression. The valley is where you come between mountains. It signifies unclean worship. It signifies low things. It signifies perverting the truth. It is when our life reaches to a point of depression. It is the lowest point of our life. It is a place where we lay back and we are at rest in Zion. Jeremiah chapter 21 and verse 13. When you get into a valley experience, you need to be very careful. Behold, I am against thee, O inhabitants of the valley. And the rock of the plain, say the Lord, would say, who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter into our inhabitants? A spirit of pride. You're in a valley place, and God says, I'm against you because you said, who is going to come down against us? The Amalekite spirit is a spirit that dwells in a valley, and that spirit is waiting. When you come into a place of depression, when you come to the lowest point of your life, uh, that spirit is waiting there to plunge and take control of your life. They're going to bring you to the lowest point. They're going to bring you to be unfruitful, to become barren, you have no use, you are unproductive, because that's the kind of spirit this Amalekai spirit is. When you find yourself don't have the energy, when you find yourself don't have the enthusiasm, when I'm no longer motivated, when I'm no longer interested in the things of God, when there is no momentum in me, I feel down, I feel discouraged, I feel depressed, when I'm at that place, watch it, that's an Amalekai spirit. It's influencing your life. It's influencing your life. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 23. How, ca how can canest thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a what? A swift, put this, put this across for me, in the, I want to get these words in the, in the NIV. Because this is important. Pull those scriptures in the NIV for me, silly. Right? He says, see how you behave in the valley. Consider what you have done. You are a swift, what? She camel running here and... Oh, Lord. Is that the word of God? Hello. He says what? I am not defiled. Isn't that a spirit of pride? Come on. I told you these, me these messages. I am not defiled. I have not run after bales. But see how you behave in the valley. 
It is in those valley experiences your behavior begins to show up. It is in those valley experiences your attitude begins to show up. So I say, I don't have to be a prophet. I just need to know the word of God. Because the word of God directs your life. And that's why, you see, I reach to the point where as a pastor, I don't run down anybody again. The word of God tells me where your spirit is. You are a she-camel running here and there. There is no stability in you. There is no strength. You have not stood your ground. There is no loyalty in what you are doing. You are easily swayed and easily persuaded. Everything is pushing you in every di different direction. Psalm tells us you are a chaff in the wind. You are blown here and there with every whims and fancies. You listen to voices and you do everything people say. There is no foundation in your life. That's an Amalekite spirit. That's what it brings you to. So that's why Psalm chapter 23 and verse 4 says, Yea, do I walk through the valleys and shadows of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. You are not designed to stay in the valley experiences. God says you will walk it through. Some of us want to live in those valley experiences. We get comfortable there. And when you get comfortable there, that's the spirit that is driving that. Make no mistake. It's a spirit that has brought you into a place that has captured you and have held you there and led you to believe that you're in a good place. But the scripture is saying you are not supposed to stay in those valleys. If you are living in those valleys, you're in a bad condition. You're living in depression. You're living in a spirit of pride. You're living in a place of discomfort. You're in a place where that spirit is going to bring you down. You become barren. You become unfruitful. And eventually you're going to die. Could I go on with this? This is the grandson of Esau. He raised up a nation. And he raised up a nation of people that is looking to take from others. They go and they dwell in the land of Cana, they're in a valley placed. They go and they dwell in the desert and they are waiting to plunge upon and take away from people. Where did this come from? This came from a generation that passed down to the grandson. Because we know the story of Esau, that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. He sold it out for a bowl of soup. He came back and he was weary. He was tired. He was hungry. But not for the things of God. He was hungry for material things. Watch this. When we do not value the things of God, we will sell it out for nothing. He did not value his birthright. He did not see the significance of his birthright. He did not see the importance of his salvation. And he sold it out for a bowl of soup. A meal that will last him once. A birthright that will take him through his entire life, that will grant him his favors because as having the birthright or the rights of a firstborn gave him a double portion or double blessing and double anointing. He did not see the importance of having the birthright. He saw that he was weary and needed soup that will feed him for one day. Sometimes we want to have pleasure just for once and destroy our entire salvation. Because we do not value the things of God. If you value the things of God, if you value your salvation, if you value where you are in God, you will get yourself in the right place with God. So we run down the wealth of this world. We want to make an extra dollar and an extra cent and an extra this. We run down the wealth of this world. We kill ourselves because we want to get that extra dollar. And when we get it, we rob God besides just doing that. 
Because this is what the Spirit does. This Spirit, people of God, brings you into a place where the wealth of this world becomes more important to you. The things of this world becomes more. The things of God become insignificant. And that's why people don't see prayer meeting as being important. Because the things of God are not important to you. That's an Amalekite spirit. You will ensure you go to work five days for the week. And you would not stay home. Even if you are sick and you are tired, you will get up and you will go to work. But you would not go the extra mile to come one hour in prayer. Why? I ask myself. Think about it. And it's not that you cannot do it. It's you choose not to do it. Mm. Anybody want the air condition turn up? Come on. That's a spirit that is driving that. And we, 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 we try to reason it. We try to find ways and method of reasoning. Well, you know, this and that and this and the other and I'm tired and I'm that. You are never tired to go to work. You are never tired when you come home to take up your wife to go and get something to eat or something to drink. You are never tired to do something at all. But you are always tired when it's time to come to church. Why? When we don't value what we have, we will lose it. Come on. When you don't value what you have, you will lose it. Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob. And Reuben went and slept with his father's wife. And the Bible says because of his sin, he lost his blessing. He lost it. Esau had a son by the name of Alfred, A-L-I-P-H-A-Z. And then he had a son by the name of Amalek. And this nation rose up. They knew the plains. They knew the desert place. They knew how to work in these places. And they are waiting for the people that comes into that place to take their life. Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 18. Let's get into this a little more. The children of Israel is journeying. And it's about over three million people that, is, that Moses is moving across. And the Bible says, when they were what? Weary and worn out. How many of you feel that way sometimes? Weary and worn out. They met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind, that had no, this is what this Amalekite spirit does. The Bible says that the Amalekites were waiting. And who was the first people that they were going after? The Amalekites were waiting, and the people that were lagging behind, those that were not more, those that were weary, those that were worn out, those who always have to say, well, I'm tired. The Bible says that they attacked all who were lagging behind, and they had no fear of God. So this Amalekites were going after the people who were weak and feeble. Those people that were behind and trying to catch up. Those people were lagging in the journey and not paying attention as to what is going on. The Amalekite was waiting to grab a hold of them. 
To, to, to be feeble means uh, to be sick, to be weak, to be impotent, without strength. They have lost their strength. And the Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if there is no, no joy of the Lord within us, we have lost our strength. We have become weak. They faint. They were weary. And the spirit is going after that because you are discouraged, you are disappointed, you are depressed, you are just going wrong in your circle. Nobody understand what I'm going through and all this kind of tralala and you're going wrong in your mess over and over. That spirit is just waiting for you to come into that place and it's going to wrap you up and take control of your life because that's exactly what that spirit wants to do with you. It's going to keep you in a depressed state. It's going to keep you in a discouraged state. It's going to keep you making ex excuses. Why? Because you're in that place where you have lost your joy. You're in that place where you feel weak, where you feel discouraged. You're in that place where you are fainting. You are lagging behind. When the church is moving forward, we are pushing momentum. You're struggling behind. Well, let go. I will catch up. There is no catching up because what that spirit is going to do is going to hold you and it's going to kill you. And it's just a matter of time that you'll backslide. It's just a matter of time you're going to backslide. So it's pulling you back. And the whole momentum of the church is gone. Where do you go to church? I go to Dival Ministries. But you don't come into Dival Ministries. You visit. You're a lager. You're struggling behind. You're weak. You're feeble. So how does God use those weak and feeble? You have to build strength. You have to build momentum. So the Bible says that they have no fear of God. Because that's the place it's going to bring you. When you come into a place where you don't understand that God sees me, there has to be some reverence. I'm not afraid of God. There is a reverence of who God is. I reverence the presence of God. I, I bring honor to it. When you have lost that, you're in a bad state. You're already backslidden. And that tells me you have allowed an Amalekai spirit to come and take control. It has taken control of your life. You are no longer wrestling in a place where you can manage. You are wrestling against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. This is age-old spirits that knows exactly how to get you into the place where they want you to go and to be. Let me show you this. Let me, let, let me, let me, let me just show you this because this is, this is so very important. What's the characteristics of this spirit? They are directly tied to doubt. Directly tied to doubt. This spirit will despise birthright. It will challenge your posture and your position in Christ. It will const constantly tell you that you're a nobody, that you're a nothing, that you're worthless, it makes no sense, you might as well give up. It brings you into a place of being depressed and being discouraged, and you will just go with the flow. How the wind blows and how the tide goes, that's how you go. It keeps you focused on the love for material things. The love for money, the love for possessions, the love, the love for position, it will keep you focused because it's going after to bring you into a mindset where the next dollar I can make is more important. It will keep you focused here. Some people are not in church this morning, not because they have to work, because they want to work. That's a big difference. They would rather go and make one, another dollar than to be in the house of God. 
Exodus chapter 12 and verse 36. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 36. When we look at this, it says, The Lord had made the Egyptians favorable, disposed towards the people, and they gave them what they asked for so that they plundered the Egyptians. When they were leaving, they went to the Egyptians. They got gold, they got silver, they got clothing, they got stuff from them. God made them favorable so that when they were journeying, they were journeying with a lot of wealth. When Moses asked to build a tabernacle, and he says, bring an offering. The Bible says that there was so much wealth that was amongst the people that Moses had to stop and say, don't bring any more because we already have enough. They brought it willingly. He says, let them bring it, what? Willingly. Don't force nobody to give it. Don't demand it for them. He that has a willing heart, let him bring it willingly. And the Bible says that they brought what they have because the wealth was dispersed amongst the people. They were blessed. They found favor. And they brought it because they saw a need that Moses got a revelation to build a place so God could come and dwell among the midst of his people. And they bought into the vision to the point where they brought what they have and they give it. Moses has to say, hold on, we have enough. Would you wish that the church of God can be like that? The Bible tells us in Acts that when they saw the need, they sold their lands, they sold their possession, and they brought it and they laid it at the apostles' feet. We, we are supposed to be a people that are blessed. We are supposed to be walking in the blessings of God. You don't run down blessings. Blessings should follow you wherever you go. When you are walking in the grace of God, you carry grace with you. You carry favor with you. And wherever you go, you meet with favor. You bring grace in the environment that you are in. We do it opposite we want to run it down. God never says to run it down. He says, you are blessed. You are children of the most high God. So they found favors and they were moved with this wealth. And the Amalekite knew that they had this wealth. They knew that they were blessed people. And so they attacked them and took away what they have. The little that you have. The little that God has blessed you with, when you find yourself in a valley experience, when you find yourself in the plains of the Amalekite, they are going to take it away from you and they are going to leave you naked with nothing. Are you hearing me this morning? It's going to bring you to that place. Next, they attack just after they overcome a situation or victorious. Next, the spirit is very warlike. It is persistent. It will want you to give up. It will wear you down. It will wear you down. The spirit, it will seek out the feeble. And those are the rare, the strugglers. Those that are most vulnerable. The spirit will seek you out. The spirit of the Amalekite is one that opposes God's plan. The nature of the spirit is to oppose. They come against because there is no fear of God. The spirit is not concerned about what you do for God. So he's coming against you. They are warlike spirit. And they, are, they come against you on anything that you decide to do for God. You make up your mind to do something for God. You say, I'm going to stand up for God. And you're going to see the attacks that is going to come against you. I challenge you today. And this spirit is not paying attention to some, some folks. They are not paying attention to you because they already have you in a place where they want you to be. A lie? They already have you exactly where they want you to be, so why bother? You're not interested in the things of God. You're not making any effort to do things for God. You're already in a very depressed, lonely, in a valley experienced place. So why bother? You're already in the place where the Spirit wants you to be. 
And if you don't come up and understand this spirit is going to destroy every facet of your life. It's going to destroy your family, your integrity, your relationship with God. It's going to destroy everything. And all you will end up being is going through the motions. I'm coming to church because people need to see me coming to church. It will look bad, so I'm coming. But you have no substance within you because the Malachi spirit is already dominating your spirit. Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. Watch this. The Amalekite came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. They came and attacked them. They did not ask. They're in Rephidim. The Amalekite came in and attacked them. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose some of our men to go out to fight the Amalekites. You don't sit back. You understand? You quickly find the Moses. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You quickly find the Moses. Go and choose some of our men who will go out and fight the Amalekites. If you feel that you're going to stand up against this old age spirit, I have what it takes. I'm going to stand up and fight this. I am telling you this morning that Moses in his wisdom says, go and find, you have to find those people that will stand up with you. That's why I preach a thing about covenant. Yes, sir. We covenant with the wrong people. And they're destroying our life. They're moving us away from the, rather than encouraging you to get more involved in the things of God, become excited about the things of God, them pulling you away from God. And we feel happy about that. So to one person recently, they tell me, I'm taking a neutral position. There is no neutral position in God. It's either you for God or you're against God. That's a compromising position. There's nothing like neutral in the church. It's either you're hot or you're cold. That already tell me where your mindset is. It's either you're hot for the things of God, or I'm cold, it's either I'm alive or I'm dead. Are you understand what I'm saying? And he says, find those men that will go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with a staff of God in my hands. Posture and position is important. Continue. So Joshua what? Fought the Amalekites. As Moses had ordered. I want us to, I want us to listen to something. Who is Joshua listening to? Talk to me. Who is Joshua listening to? Moses. You see where our problem is? You want to fight the Amalekite, but you want to listen to everybody else. Who is he listening to? I'm raising up young sons in the house. I'm raising up leaders, and I'm, I constantly keep telling them there is only one voice you must listen to. One voice. And that's instilling in their spirit, and you will hear them talking against each other. I only want to hear what the Rev has to say. I only want to hear the father of the house. <laughs> one voice. Why? Because it is the voice he ordered them. And the Bible says, and he fought the Amalekite as Moses had ordered. And Moses and Aaron and her went to the top of the hill. Continue. And as long as Moses held up his hand, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, they are... Are you seeing how you're addressing this? Hello, are you seeing how you're addressing this? There is a covering that has to be over your life. There is a voice that you have to hear. You're, if you're in a bad place, you have to realign yourself very quickly because there is a covering that has to come over your life. As long as that covering is there, as long as Moses was there, the Bible says that they were winning the battle. They were fighting against the Amalekite. They were winning it. But as long as the covering was not there, the Amalekite was taking control of them. Next verse. Is that a verse? And when Moses' hand grew tired, they took a stone. I don't have time to, to, to dissect this. And put it under him. And he sat on it. And Aaron and her held up his hand. One on one side, one on the other. So that his hands remain what? Sturdy. Till the sunset. This, this demonic spirit is going to fight you from sunrise to sunset. It is not a spirit that is given up. 
is not a spirit that is going to say, I'm going to try something. This spirit is determined to destroy you. It's coming to fight you until it wears you down, until you get tired. You, understand? you have to have the stamina and the strength to stand up and fight until sunrise to sunset. You have to ensure that there is a covering over your life. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the... How do you fight the spirit with the word of God? With the word of God. And if there is no word in you, well, you are sitting duck. Let me, let me, let me just get across to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And Selina, I, I, I want to, verse 15, I may go a little before that. Go to verse 1. First Samuel chapter 15 and verse 1. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you as king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. Are we listening? Are we listening this morning? Listen, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will what? Punish the Amalekai for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came out from Egypt. He says they destroyed them. They were in ref for them. They came against them. They, they, they killed the people that were lying. He says, I'm going to punish them because of that. Go on. Now go attack the Amalekite and do what? Totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spear them. You see, we like it. We become comfortable. We don't want to destroy it. And it's gradually going to destroy our life. You miss one Sunday, you're going to miss two Sunday, you're going to miss three Sunday, and before long, you backslide already, you know. You backslide long time. Hear what it says. Put to death the men, the women, the children, the infants, the cattle, the sheep, the camel, the donkey. Put everything. Why would God, hold that scripture. Why would God come to a nation and to, to, a, to a, man of, a man of God and says, send Saul out and I want you to destroy every single thing. Do not spare nothing. Because whatever you spear is going to influence your life. There is a spirit behind this that is going to influence your life. So when the Bible says, "Do not uh, be not unequally yoked," the Scripture knows what it was saying. Because we find ourselves in problems, and it comes here now when he says, "Put it to death." Go to the next verse. So Saul summons the men and mustered them. As Tileam and 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah, and he goes against them. Now go down to verse 9. Go back to verse 8 for me. Saul gets a word from the man of God Go and destroy these people. He didn't need to hear nothing else again. That word that the man of God told him was enough. That's why you have to listen to one voice. There's a prophet, uh, Jeroboam or so, or so, that went and came back and heard another prophet who told him that, no, you could go ahead and eat, and he, and he lost his life. He heard the voice, and heard, what did Saul say? And Saul, and he took Agar, the king of the Amalekite, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agar and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat, the calves, and the lamb. Everything that was. Is that the word that's, that, that he was told to do? You, you see how disobedience has come in? You see how subtle disobedience has come in? No, Pastor, I'm not disobedient, you know. But the man of God just told you, this is what God says. The man of God is preaching his lungs out this morning. This is what this Amalekai spirit is about. Get your life in order. 
And we still want to spare something because we feel in our own thinking that this is good for us. You tell yourself in your own mindset that no, this is good for me. Forget what, Saul, what Samuel says. Samuel, you know, Samuel, listen to me. We will spare this man. He's a king, you know. And we will hold some of the sheep and the cattle and whatnot. These were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, he totally destroyed. So in, in, in his own thinking, he decided what I'm going to destroy and what I'm not going to destroy. How many are like that today? I will decide. Pastor is not to tell me. I will tell myself. When I'm coming, when I'm not coming. What I will do, what I will not do. How I will do it and how I will not do it. I will tell myself that. What does that remind you of? Verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel. You see, we, 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 we have to come into a place where you, can, you have to understand you can't hide nothing from the man of God. It repented me, verse 11, that I have set up Saul to be king. What, what a sad state. That God called you, who chose you, he set you out, and then God says, it repents me that I have done this. I am so sorry that I have done this. I have made a grave mistake in doing this. I have made King Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all night. It grieved his spirit that God could say, it repented me that I have done this. Verse 12. And Samuel arose early in the morning, got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told that Saul has gone to Camel. So he, first of all, he's not where he's supposed to be. He decided he wanted to do what he wanted to do. So he moved and he gone. So he has set up a momentum in his... <laughs> I'm sure you didn't read that. Did you read that? Do you see that? Do you, do you see the pride of this man? One simple instruction, go and destroy every single thing because these are Malachites. They are going to destroy you. That little, rela that, that little thing that you just allowed, that little relationship and everything, it's going to destroy you. You're not seeing it. It's going to destroy you because this is a spirit that has been there way before your time. It knows exactly how to get to you. It knows exactly what you're interested in. And he will tap into that. And he, what does he do? He set up a momentum in his own honor and he turned and gone on down to Gilgal. Continue. And when Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the what? The Lord's instruction. Now, if, if Samuel was like me, you take a piece of wood. You understand what I'm saying? Man of God, I have carried out all your instruction. Next verse, continuing. Good reading, isn't it? And then Samuel said, what then is the bleating of sheep in my ears? Since you have done so good, since you have carried out all my instruction as the Lord, little did he know that the, that, that the man of God already heard what God says. His spirit is grieving within him. He comes to Saul now, and Saul has the audacity to say, I have done all that you have asked me to do. That's people. You come before the man of God and you lie. And you feel that the man of God don't know. You come before the man of God with tricks and schemes. And you feel that the man of God don't know. And it grieves the spirit because God has already says, this is where your spirit is. 
And he comes to him and he says, what is the loan of cattle that I hear? Continue. And Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekite. I'm sure you know some people who like to pass the blame. Hmm? But, but, but if you know it's them, you know, it's not me. If, if I, if it was me, I would have never allowed that. But who got the instruction? When I place leaders in this church, I watch the leaders. Because I give instruction. Whatever the followers does is a reflection on the leaders. If the leaders lead by example, they will follow. If the leaders encourage it and build momentum, they will follow. Whatever the, wherever the leader is, wherever the followers is, that means that the leader is worse than the follower. That's not a leader. Whatever is done in the music, whatever is done in the media, whatever, has to reflect the leader. The leader builds momentum. The leader causes it to happen. The leader makes it happen. I don't have to come and be saying it two and three and four and five times. Let's get it done. I often say we want musicians for, for prayer meeting. We want it for this. We want it there. If you can't get it done, let's get somebody to get it done. You simply say, I, I can't handle this leadership thing. Get it done. So you come and you say, yes, I'm the leader. But you're not doing it. There's bleating of sheep. There is cattle that I'm hearing. What am I hearing? And he says, they have spared the best sheep and the cattle are sacrificed to the Lord your God. Look how we're changing it now. They have spared it as a sacrifice to your God. So I wonder if it's, it's no longer his God. It's the same God who wanted to bless him so that he could be king. It's the same God who says, I'm going to bless Saul, anoint him to be king. It's that same God, he wants to take things that belong to the enemy. Things that is defiled. Things that God refused. And he wants to bring it into the house of God. Dishonor in the house of God. And hear what he says. But we totally destroy the rest. Listen to Samuel. Next verse. Enough! That song's like an angry man. He has a right to be angry. He has a right to be back. Enough! Samuel says to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. <laughs> Did not this man went to God? Let me tell you now what the Lord says. Tell me, Saul replied. Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribe of Israel, the Lord's anointed? Eh? Let me remind you this morning that when some of you came into this church, you didn't know nothing. You were a workmanship in the hands of God. And it took God... Forget the pastor. It took God to mold you and bring you and infuse you with talents and giftings and skill and build you up. You were nothing, Samuel saying. But God brought you up where you are. Nothing that you have belongs to you. It is God that gives you the skill, the talents, the giftings, and the grace. Because you can come up here and you can sing a million songs and nobody could be blessed. And you can make a very good performance. But it's the anointing, because the anointing, that's what it does. He anointed you, that is going to make a way for you. Over king of Israel, continue. And he send you on a mission. Go and completely destroy those, what? Wicked people, the Amalekite. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Verse 19, we continue. Good reading. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you not obey the Lord? Now I want you to, I want you to see the undermining message that is coming into this. Saul has an instruction from the man of God. This spirit is so seductive, seducing, wise, that it led Saul to see that he don't need to destroy us. You understand? 
You could spear us. Would you imagine Saul going to kill the king and the king looking at him and that's a Malachite spirit gets into him and says, no, you don't need to destroy. This is a king. You don't destroy a king. Look at, this, look at the good sheep. You don't destroy that. Gets into his spirit and he starts to reason. That is how the spirit is going to operate. It brings you into a place where you are disobedient to the word of God. Disobedient to the word of God. And cause you to analyze in your own self, in your own thinking, how you see it. Why did you not pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Why? But I did obey the Lord, Saul says. I went on a mission the Lord assigned me and I completely destroyed the Amalekite. And I brought back Agar, their king. Next verse. And the soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder and the best of what was devoted to God in order to sacrifice them to the Lord the, your God. And Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offering and sacrifice? And that's the backdrop of this verse. As much as in obeying the Lord, to obey is what? To obey is to obey. We are living in an environment where there is total disobedience. Nobody wants to submit. Nobody wants to hear the voice. Nobody wants to come under total rebellion and disobedience. He says to obey is better than sacrifice, than to heed to the, better than the fat of rams. Continue. For rebelliousness is like what? The sin of divination. And arrogance is like the evil of... And people are rising up with a very arrogant spirit. They're rising up in rebellion. When you come into a place where you are submissive, you, you, you get rid of those stuff. Those are carnal things. And that kind of spirit is what comes from the Amalekite. You don't have to ask me. I am telling you that that's a demonic spirit that is influencing your life. When you're a Christian and a child of God and the joy of the Lord is in you and you're reading the word and you're spending time in prayer and in fellowship, your spirit is totally different. Because you have rejected the Lord, the word of the Lord, he has what? This is the same man that God was going to anoint. When the man of God makes a decision, sometimes people get vexed. But you have to understand that the decision first starts from another realm. When God rejects you, you could do all that you want. You can never come back to the place of being a king. Are you hearing me? Did I not tell you that this Amalekite spirit is to wear you down and bring you into a place where you are nothing? This Amalekite spirit is to bring you, to pull down your entire integrity, to pull down your entire name. Just, just a moment ago, Saul, you were king. Just a moment ago, you had the sword in your hand. Just a moment ago, you had soldiers underneath you. You were doing stuff. All of a sudden, you decide to compromise the word of God. You de decide to compromise what the prophet, what the man of God is saying. And God says, I have rejected you as being a king. Why? Because you were what? Rebellious. Rebellious. Verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, verse 24. I have sinned and violated the Lord's command and your instruction. Is this the word of God? Is this the word of God? Unless we come to a place of repentance, you will continue to live in a spirit of arrogance. Because repentance is what breaks arrogance. Repentance is what breaks rebelliousness. Repentance is what breaks pride. I have sinned and I have violated the Lord's commandment and your instructions. I was afraid of the men and so I what? Come on, we all do this. 
Hello? We all afraid of what people will say. We all afraid of what they will think. We all afraid of how they will look at us. And nobody wants to stand up for truth. Nobody wants to be loyal. Because we are about what the people, how the people see me. We are not about what God says and how God sees me. We are about what the people see. We are people pleasers. The people must see me in a certain way. The people must understand who I am. So we do it to please the people. When you do it to please God, you're, you're not going to win a lot of friends. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You're not going to win a lot of favors. But it's better God be pleased with you than everybody else. It's better you stand up for righteousness. It's better you stand up for holiness. It's better you stand up for what is right. I tell you, when I read this, and when I studied, it shook my spirit. And I held it within my spirit. And I waited, and I waited, and I pondered upon God. Because I wanted to digest it in my spirit. And I made a decision there and then on my knees that I'm going to stand up for holiness and righteousness. It doesn't matter what people say. And I'm going to preach this word. If you're offended and you don't like it, as I said, if you don't like the meat, walk with your milk. Because we play Christian. We play Christianity. Church has become a joke. It has become a, a, a social club. And nobody is standing up for righteousness. Nobody is preaching and saying this thing. And the Amalekai spirit is destroying life over and over and over again. We are about the position. We are about doing stuff for God. And we are not getting our life right before him. Verse 24. Verse, verse, not verse 24, rather. Um. Let's see, how, let's see how Samuel did, dealt with this. Verse 32. Where well, we know Saul repented, right? In verse, in verse 31. Verse 32. And then Samuel said, Bring me Agar, the king of the Amalekites. Now the man of God has to do what you, the leader, is supposed to do. You see what, how sad this is? The man of God just gives you instruction as a, as a leader. I want this done. I want this to be done. Now the man of God has to come to do what you, as a leader, is supposed to do. Bring me Agar, the king of the Amalekite. And Agar came to him in what chains? And he taught... Surely the bitterness of death is past. Okay? And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless. Are you hearing what the Spirit does? So will your mother be childless amongst women. If you don't destroy these things that rises up in the house of God, if you don't destroy the things that rises up in your life and in your family, it will destroy you. And that's why he told them, utterly destroy it. I preached last week that fathers need to make a stand in the house. You have to make a stand in your house. So Samuel now says, and Samuel put Agar to death before the Lord at what? Gilgal. So Samuel took the sword and he killed the king. Let me close this. Can I get through all of this this morning? What you do not destroy will defile you. What you do not destroy will defile you. It is only the grace of God that delays judgment. If we come into a place of soul, 
and a place of repentance. It is in God's good nature by his grace to forgive you and to bring you to a place. But it must start with God. Thank you.